So the talk is genres unimagined. So I'm going to pretend to be a futurist today and try to figure out not not you know next year but ten years out. Kind of like think about what's going. And I might ne not necessarily name specific genres that are going to be going to be huge, but kind of talk about what I think I see changing in our industry, and what is specifically really exciting to me about what's happening in the industry and the movements here. So I want to offer a disclaimer first. This is not going to be a talk about games that you should be investing in or games that are going to make you rich. If you want to do that, there's an entire casino track for soul-sucking games. Um, this is going to be about games that I think are going to advance our industry as a whole. And some of those games, are they may make you rich. But early on, they're going to be niche games. And, uh, and, and people should be aware of the way that this industry is going to evolve. So... Um, so this might not be for everyone. So I, I want to start by talking, I don't know if you can read that from there, so I'll read off these mechanics. I want to talk about some of the classic video game mechanics that sort of we established early in our industry. I think the vast majority of the games that are out on display today have at least one of these mechanics. So attack, jump, duck, kill, 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 die. The, you know, these are sort of like lives and deaths are sort of this, you know, we all understand what these means in a video game context. But unfortunately, really, a lot of these come from our evolutionary history. And the way that evolution works it tends to follow a path of least resistance. So, so that, you know, our, in our early games, when we, when we had very limited hardware and very limited ability for expressiveness, these mechanics, attacking and killing and dying and jumping, were easy to express. Um, unfortunately, since uh, evolution does tend to take the path of least resistance, as our industry evolved, we found really beautiful ways to attack and kill and jump and die. Um, but oftentimes, we forgot to ex consider more expressive mechanics. And the ones that I've listed here, in case they're hard to read at the back, are discuss, explore, emote, communicate, feel. Now, there are absolutely some fantastic games out here that out there that do this sort of thing. Um, but, uh, you, you know, in terms of an art form, if we're going to evolve games as an art form, we're so far behind other art forms in terms of exploring these sorts of emotions and these sorts of verbs that we want to interact with. And I, I think games are really well suited to explore a lot of these areas. Um, so, you know, classical, liter classical art and literature, they're way ahead of us here. It's time for us to catch up. Um, so for convenience, I want to kind of, again, this is, it might be hard to read some of these categories here, but as an industry, we'd love to categorize all of our, note, our, our game genres and put them in little boxes. Um, so on the list here, I kind of have board games, RPGs, MMOs, adventure, ARGs, educational games. And I think sometimes we fall prey to the notion that, 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 this, is our, that this map is all of the space of games that can ever exist. And, and what we need to do now is, is do mashups. But the only thing that mashups do is get get us halfway points between the plan, the, the points that exist on our map. I mean, I sure think you know I have up in the upper left hand corner here where the Americas weren't quite fleshed out when this map was made. I have virtual reality, and I think we all know, you know, that's that's a new genre of games, a new area that we're pushing into, um, and you know that's this one of our final frontiers. And what I want to suggest is that really, if you zoom out, the map looks much more like this. And this is just zooming out one level. You can zoom out much much further of this. The space of potential games that can exist is enormous, and we've only seen a tiny little portion of it. That there are vast swaths of unexplored territory waiting to be discovered. And the, the, the uh, examples of genres that I put in here, serious games, interactive narrative, personal stories, which I represent as an entire galaxy, as personal stories can be as, as, as vast as the number of humans that there are on Earth. Um, this still, these are just representative. We really, we don't necessarily know what's out there. So it's hard to talk about this without addressing the technology. Um, and you may think that we're waiting for technology to move us into these new unexplored genres. Um, but I, I really want you to ask yourself, what could you do with a holodeck? What could you do with the most amazing, realistic, immersive technology that you can imagine that you really can't do? Is there a story that you can't tell now? Is there an emotion that you can't convey now that you're waiting for the technology to, to improve so that you can do that? Um, and sure, yeah, I mean, it could be just like real life. That's really cool, but we have a platform for that. It's called real life, and we can do things here. Um, I, I, I sort of want to... to um, to put forward the thesis that the technology that you that you need to make your dream game already exists. It may not be as beautiful as you want or quite as immersive as you want, but the technology is there. That's not what's holding us back from future genres. And as a reminder of that, I want to talk about just how much computational power we carry in our pockets every day. And we all have our smartphone in our, our pocket, but the current generation smartphone has about the equivalent 
com computational power and GPU and memory as an Xbox 360. So kind of keep that in mind. Uh, you know, on top of that, like, let's put this rel relative to, to, you know, really like a um, grand human achievement. So let's put this relative to the flight computer on the space shuttle. The Xbox 360 has about the computational power of the flight shuttle on the, the, the flight shuttle, uh, space shuttle flight computer times 100. Like, seriously, like, it, you know, the, the technology that landed us on the moon was, f was far less mature than that. It's not the technology that's holding us back. And, and as more reminders of where we are in technology, this is rendered on the web in WebGL, you know? Like, we're basically, I mean, yeah, he's a little creepy. I know there's a little uncanny valley still going on there, but we're getting really close to the point where we can create a very convincing human without even having to download a program or run it natively. You can do this in WebGL. This is a, a screenshot from a, a, a game, Facade. I bought this up for reference of artificial intelligence. This is a game that was made by two people six years ago where basically it's an interactive text game. Where you, so you're interacting with these characters by typing and you play the role of a friend kind of awkwardly brokering a marriage dispute. And there's a lot of amazing emotional content in here done by two people with AI six years ago on your home computer. And, and, and um, you know, in, on the AI side, the Loebner Prize is given to AI bots that attempt to achieve the Turing test. There's a competition every year. And in these competitions, for several years, several programs have succeeded in convincing judges that they are human. This is where we're at in artificial intelligence. And you know, these are, these are all applications that are run on your local computer, but I want to remind you that when you need something a little bit more powerful, let's not forget that there is an application out there right now that can basically query the entire body of human knowledge in milliseconds. And, and you know, these, are, these sorts of tools, these, these cloud tools are, you know, if, if you really need more power to, 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 you know, to back your AI, um, then the cloud has become a commoditized option. You can go out to AWS and get a server. And with our game, Extra Solar, um, that's exactly what we're doing. We render these images in the cloud so that you can play them on any device. It doesn't matter what the computational power of, your de the, of the device in your hand is. Now, I'm not going to say that the, the technology doesn't matter. You know, the, the things that we have on our phone, the, the GPS, the accelerometer, the, the compass, these let us interact with our world in different ways. And these are going to enable new gameplay mechanics, and that's really cool. Virtual reality is going to allow us greater immersion into our virtual worlds, but ultimately it's not about the technology. Um, well, the, the technology will make our products more beautiful, they'll make our products more immersive, but they're not necessarily going to make our, product, our, our stories or our games more emotional. Um, so I, th I really think the technology is out there to do what you want to do. And, and not only that, like let's remind us that some of our favorite you know, award-winning games from the last few years could have very comfortably run on a Nintendo 64 or, or even an older, you know, a Super Nintendo. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, we don't necessarily need huge computational power to capture these. Okay, so I basically, I've made this, this, this thesis that it's not technology that's going to get us to where we want to go into these new genres. So, so how then are we going to travel into these strange unknown genres? And I'm going to break this down and do, I don't know why that's there. I'm going to break this down into uh, three points. New voices, we need to let go of our assumptions, and there's going to be cross-pollination, between, not between games, but between games and other art forms. Um, I don't know why that's blank either. All right, so let's talk first a little bit about new voices. For a long time, our industry has really been dominated by cisgender, heterosexual, white men. And um, we grew up on console games. You know, we all have, have an assumption built into us about what a game is supposed to be. And that's why we've kind of gone into this industry. And we're finally seeing new voices tell different stories. And that, to me, is really exciting, seeing new people in our industry. And, these voices don't just have different stories to tell because they're racially different or they have a different sex or they have a different sexuality, but they're also often unencumbered by the history of video games. And these new voices are being powered, empowered by tools that have opened the doors for novices to create and distribute their ideas and tell their stories in a new interactive form. And we're really just kind of seeing the first generation of this. And you know, as young women see other people creating their personal stories, I think that you know, the next generation is really going to be see games as a potential potential, just, just like writing or poetry, to tell their own stories. And this is really exciting to me. And these voices are empowered by 
their own personal experiences, their unbiased expectations about what a game is supposed to be. They've never been told that's not possible or that's not what a game is supposed to be. And so they're willing to try something new. And this is really exciting to me. Um, a couple examples in this genre, um, I sh shouldn't call it a genre. I mean, it's going to be like a you know, whole co vast collection of genres. Um, Dysphoria and Manichi were very personal short form games. One was made in Flixel, one was made in RPG Maker. So there's very little overhead to get involved in these. And neither of the authors of these really considers themselves game makers. They kind of started in the media side and said, you know what, I can tell my story myself. I don't need to wait for somebody to tell that story for me. We have tools like Twine. Um, this is uh, one of Porpentine's award-winning games, Howling Dogs. Um, you know, watching Porpentine talk about the creation process for this game was amazing because she, as she explains it, within the first 15 seconds of working with this tool, you're writing content that will become part of the of the user-facing story, and that's really empowering to somebody. That's really amazing that it takes so little effort to tell a great story. Um, you know, you might think that text games are, are dead, but um, but this is opening game creation to a whole new audience. Um, and then we have things like repurposed FPS technology. So we have Gone Home, which tells this amazing emotional story that doesn't involve guns or ducking and shooting. Um, and uh, so I basically I want to tell, to, to really just encourage everyone in this room to, to help cultivate these voices and, and bring people in who, you, who might not consider themselves part of the game industry. They might say, I'm not interested. Show them what you're making and get their feedback and let them participate in the creative process. And I think that a lot of new stories are going to come out of this. Um, okay, so what if you are a cisgender, heterosexual, white male? Does that mean you're creatively bankrupt? Uh, unfortunately, yes. No, obviously, you know, white men have created a lot of, you know, genre-defining amazing games, but I, I still want to just encourage you to, to, you know, bring new voices into the process. Um, and this brings me a little bit into our second point, which is to let go of your assumptions. So I talked previously about, um, you know, the, the evolutionary history of our industry. And I want to really try to encourage you to not be bound by the assumptions, by our evolutionary past, to forget about ideas, uh, you know, the, the ideas that have gotten us here, and to really move into new places. Um, this is one thing specifically I want to talk about. A, a lot of the game design, like, especially at this conference, you're going to hear a lot about metrics-driven design. And the result of metrics-driven design, especially if you started too early in the process, is the least controversial, most benign incarnation of the, pro of the version of the product that you can make. Is there a place for metrics-driven design? Absolutely. Are you creating artwork for metrics-driven design? Absolutely not. This is the opposite of the process that you use to create artwork or new genres or expand the bounds of our industry. This is how you create corporate logos, not art. Um, so is there a place for it? Absolutely. But just be cautious with how you use metrics-driven design. I want to encourage everyone to go to game jams. Even if you think that you're not a game developer, or that you that you don't have a role there, or you just or you feel too experienced to go to a game jam, please go to game jams. They happen all over the world. The biggest one is the Global Game Jam coming up at the end of January. It's amazing. It's empowering. Um, multiple reasons. One, this is a great place to intermingle with new voices and get new ideas. Two, it's a great place to experiment in a in a space where failure is acceptable. Inve investing 48 hours into a new idea, it doesn't matter if you fail. What matters is that you're, you're trying something new and you're willing to kind of go out of your comfort bounds, even try a new tool. I've learned so many new tools at Game Jams because there are other people willing to help teach me those things. Um, and three, the themes of the Game Jam are oftentimes really difficult. They're, they're a tough constraint. That constraint will often help you learn to flex your creative creativity and move you into new spaces that you might not have thought that you would go. Um, and really, again, you know, this. I don't know why, but for some reason, industry veterans tend not to go to these events. Please go. Both because you're giving back to the, to the emerging generation of new game designers, but also because it's really going to be very healthy for you. Um, and just, I want to give a few examples of games that have come out of game jams. Life Goes On, Spell Tower. Spell Tower came from the Fuck This game jam, where you were supposed to make a game in a genre that you hate. And it became this huge award-winning successful game. Um, Sur Surgeon Simulator, you know, just like something that started as, as very silly that, you know, really caught on. Um, you know, in the, in, the, in the vein of letting go assumptions, this is a, a screenshot from Centris. You know, this is a game, you know, we talk about, you know, we really want to allow our, our users to be expressive. And oftentimes, Sometimes what we 
do is say, okay, well, you can buy a new hair color. Like, that's our limit of allowing our users to be expressive. Get beyond that. Let your users really be expressive. With Centris, when you play this game, you make an original piece of music that you save as your own. You created it. You, you don't have to have any musical skills, but you are creating and exploring with, me, with music, which is really super powerful and, and empowering for people. Um, LG for a Dead World, which I just learned about. In this game, you share the responsibility of telling the story with the creator. So you're actually writing the story as you go along and you share your notes with other players in the game. So this brings me to my third point, cross-pollination. And again, I want to remind you that by cross-pollination, I don't just mean mashups with other games within the industry. I mean cross-pollination with other art forms, more mature art forms, literature, sculpture, dance, uh, classical art. Um, and I think that there's a lot of, of inspiration to draw from previous artistic movements. Uh, one example that I think that we're really overdue for is an impressionistic movement in games. And to be clear, I don't just mean a game where the art style is in the, the, the vein of impressionistic painters. I mean impressionism in its purest form, where rather than trying to convey something literal or specific, a place or a time, you're trying to achieve an emotional experience, and you do it in a non-literal way. Um, and I think that in particular, games are so well suited to capture emotions that other art forms have not been well suited for. Uh, you know, and examples of this might be helplessness, guilt, or empathy. And you know, you might think, you know, why do I want to, you know, why do I want to, you know, bring up the feeling of guilt in a player? But um, but it it is like you know, just tapping into new emotions that haven't been well discovered. I think is really something that we need to do. We need to get beyond just like violence and death and and uh, um, you know, some of our our standard game challenges. And I think that some games are already doing, they're, they're already sort of falling into this impressionistic movement. So this is a, a screenshot of Panoramical. It's, uh, I don't know if anybody's played it, but it's, it's kind of this ambient game. You have these, all these MIDI knobs that you're, that you're sliding around, and the, the environment and the music are all changing in response. And usually this game is played with a big audience of people kind of looking on and just taking in the experience. Um, you know, some people would say, well, that's not a game, right? There's no objective. It doesn't really matter. We need to let go of those assumptions about what a game is supposed to be if we want to move our industry forward. Um, Flower, you know, it has an objective, but I think that this is a very great um, impressionistic game. It's not trying to tell a specific story, but it's very good at conveying a particular emotion, and that's super powerful. Um, you know, art, we, art can be very political and subversive, and I think that we don't explore that enough in games, and I think we're really overdue for that. I think games are extremely well suited for teaching a political story or um, trying to, to, to kind of get a point, to basically put a player in someone's shoes who they might not otherwise empathize with. Um, and this is a game that did, did that very well. It was another award-winning uh, game called Unmanned. Um, really, just, there's, there's actually a lot of really amazing political games out there. I mean, there's also games like Democracy 3, which is, you know, it creates this very expressive system to explore a political space. Um, so I want to sort of conclude with this idea. You know, some of you might be thinking, um, oh, that's really like artsy fartsy, great. That's really cool. But new ideas are risky. I don't want to pursue risky ideas. I have, a, I have, you know, a family to feed. Um, and, and this is why big studios often don't pursue these, you know, these games in new genres and new spaces. Um, here's the news flash. Established genres are risky too. Um, you know why? Why spend uh, your time making the 999th clone of, of um, Flappy Bird when you can do something genuinely new and have that niche to yourself? You know, be willing to to. You know, I, I know it feels like a bigger risk, but that's not necessarily the case if you can establish a new risk um, and have an uncrowded market. Uh, and even if you're risk averse and don't want to contribute to this movement of art games um, or nascent genres, join a game jam and just for a few days a year stop worrying about will it make money and just try to create an experience that's personal to you. And I think that that, that experience is going to trickle over into the rest of your career. Um, you know, if we're really lucky, in the span of our careers, we'll make maybe 20 ga games if we're really lucky. And I think that it's important for everyone to ask themselves what they want those games to be. And years from now, when you re reflect back on your career, are you going to be more proud of your work on Farmville 4? Or that little weekend project that you spent 48 hours on that made one friend that touched them so closely that they cried? 
And I want to leave you with that thought. Thank you. And I think I have about nine minutes, or five, I guess five minutes for questions, if anybody has questions. Yep. I had a question. Um, yeah, just curious. Hopefully I can formulate this question well enough. Um, great, great talk. Uh, I really liked it. Um, I, I'm also interested in um, how games might be able to raise uh, social awareness for different things. It sounds like really exciting to try to do that. Um, I'm wondering, though, like when, I, when I've been looking at this myself, um, I looked at uh, Apple and um, releasing a game on iOS, and it talked about a little bit like they, there's a chance that they're not going to allow to have some games that, are, like, you know, if it was like about religious sort of tolerance and things like that, it sounds like they're not going to allow that to happen. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. One, there are a lot more platforms than Apple. Yeah. Two, there was a huge outcry against this. If you can get that kind of media attention, release on Android, you know, and like people will flood to your game. I would not worry about the censorship. There are so many platforms that you can put these games on. Uh, just to make sure, for the camera's benefit, to repeat the question, is there concern about basically censorship of games that fall under the, like, the religion or po politics clause? Um, I am working on three games right now. One's about um, bullying. One is about um, racism and, and uh, privilege. And another one is about the lenses through which you see the world. Um, I don't expect those games to ever make any money, but uh, I'm specifically targeting them for web because it means that they can reach a wide audience. I Definitely, I would not let fear of censorship hold you back. The, the best possible outcome is that Apple censors you and that you can do a really huge blog post on it and get a lot of attention. There was a question up here, too. Hey, I just wanted to ask, uh, thanks for the interesting uh, stuff. I wanted to ask, uh, what what kind of niche genre do you think is the, is the least niche? <laughs> the one that's closest to, like, comes out, um, it'll, it'll hit a mainstream audience. Be attracted to mainstream. So what, what new niche audience has a mainstream potential? Um, I actually think that art games, like, you know, like the impressionistic sorts of games that I was talking about, I think there's more potential there than people realize. Um, it's going to definitely take a while for any of those sorts of games to get traction, but with games like, you know, now that we have things that we can compare it to, like Flower or Journey, um, I think that it really opens the doors to new developers. And that's, you know, this is not going to be an easy process, you, you know, evolving our industry and exploring these new spaces. Um, and like I warned, a lot of the first generation games will be kind of pushed to the side and, and they'll be labeled art games. Um, but the people who matter, the people who are going to be our, our next generation of game developers, they're going to take notice and, and take these new ideas and run with them. Um, so, so there might be some selfless giving uh, required to make, to make our industry move forward. Yep? Kind of a follow up to that, and I mean, I, I thought the talk was great, I completely agree with you, but just to play devil's advocate a little bit, I think when you look back at other uh, forms of art and other media, the danger here is that when you do sort of democratize it and let people go nuts, you get a lot of junk. And so, is there a danger you think of, okay, well, if we make a million games about social awareness or, or racism, most of those are terrible, and then the whole, the whole thing gets thrown, the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater because people are like, all these games are bad. Is there any danger there at all? Or? So, I mean, the question I think is about curation. Like, do we, you know, do we have to worry about curation? Is there going to be a, a lot of garbage out there? Because I know there's no problem at all with garbage in the App Store or Android right now. So, you know, there, there's going to be garbage, absolutely. And the curation process is really important. And I think companies like Apple are still figuring curation out. Um, I think uh, the media is still figuring curation out. And what I hope happens is that dominant personalities emerge in these niche genres who cultivate a community of people and they say, you know, if you were interested in Flower, you're going to love this new game, Unmanned. Um, or if you were interested in, you know, the games that are coming out of Moly Industria, you're going you're gonna to love, um, you know, th this new game. Um, and, and I think that um, 
Yeah, there's going to be the, I mean, there's going to be need to improve the curation both on the distribution side and also on the the media and blogger side. And I think that's going to happen organically. It's taken a lot longer than I expected, but I think it's going to happen.